Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here and, and tell you a little bit about some recent work we have done on, on new types of, uh, of Vanya functions and um, that we have implemented in the atomic simulation environment. And so the outline of this talk, here it is, um, will be as follows. So first I, I will uh, talk about what, what we call partly occupied Vanya functions, which uh, can be seen as, a, as really maximally localized Vanya functions for the case where you have entangled bands. I'll come back to what I, what I mean by that. So these are not really um, the, the uh, Vanya functions for entangled band that you have uh, studied so far, I would imagine, but, but a slightly different type. And I write here uh, history because this is uh, work that actually dates back to my PhD, which is uh, about uh, 15 years ago by now. Um, so it's uh, so I'm, I'm actually happy to talk about this topic because I haven't talked about it for 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 many years. So uh, it's it's always nice to get a little bit back uh, uh, along memory um, along memory lane. Um, so, but recently we have now um, um, worked a bit more on this and and developed the concept a bit further, and that has led led to this new type of Vanya function that we call balanced Vanya functions. And this is something I believe could be relevant for doing, um, um, for example, high throughput vanyarizations, because these uh, vanya functions tend to be more robust than the uh, conventional vanya functions, at least as far as we have found. Um, so I'll talk about how we define these spread balanced vanya functions uh, using um, a new type, an, a new spread functional. It's just the traditional one with a penalty term. That, that distributes the spread of the Vanya functions more evenly among the entire set of Vanya functions. And, and then I'll talk about how we um, uh, developed a protocol for selecting the um, initial guess for the Vanya function, something that is important uh, when you want to do automatic construction of Vanya functions, and also how to select the ideal number of Vanya functions. And again, I'll come back to what I mean by ideal number of Vanya functions. And then I'll show an application of this where we calculated uh, Vanya functions for a set of materials in a uh, more or less automated uh, fashion. So I put high throughput here, but it's, it's actually not really high throughput. It was about 30 different materials, but still. Uh, and then I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, the atomic simulation environment and the atomic simulation recipes, which are respectively a Python Envir scripting environment for working with um, atomic structures and, uh, and, and uh, managing electronic structure calculations. And then the ASR, which is a more recent development, is a high throughput uh, workflow framework um, relying on the uh, ASE and using the ASE quite heavily. Then I'll give an application of that, uh, of the ASR uh, framework. Um, namely this uh, C2DB database, which is a database of, of two-dimensional materials, a pretty uh, comprehensive database that we have used um, the ASR to construct um, over the past few years. And then I'll, I'll uh, also um, talk about how we have mined that database uh, in the search for new topological insulators. And I chose that topic because it has some uh, relation to, uh, to Vanya functions. Um, hybrid Vanya functions in particular. I guess you have already heard about that uh, during the course of this summer school. Okay, so um, so just uh, uh, some basics of uh, Vanya functions. Uh, I'm sure you already know this. This is the um, spread functional or the spread of a set of Vanya functions. So that's the sum of the uh, second moments of the set of, of, uh, of functions. And then if we have a cell with periodic boundary conditions, which is sufficiently large, then the minimization of this spread is equivalent to maximizing the uh, omega functional here, which I will in the following refer to as the, as the spread functional. Um, and I, I give some, um, um, some references down here where this was all 
introduced uh, and pioneered. Now, um, the spread of an linear function number n can then be calculated from the um, uh, from these uh, uh, C matrix elements according uh, to this formula here. I'm just saying that because I'm going to look a lot at uh, at the spreads of the Vanier functions in the following. So the partly occupied Vanier functions. Um, <clears throat> let, so let, first, if if we if we um, Think of the uh, Vanya functions by Sosa, Masari, and Vanderbilt that I'm sure you've heard about in this uh, workshop here, this summer school. Uh, the way they are constructed, we start by obtaining um, the K subspaces by minimizing the dispersion of the bands throughout the Brie ring zone. And then once we've done that, we produce maximally localized Vanya functions within uh, by, by finding the optimal unitary transformation of the states within each of these K subspaces. Um, now, instead of doing this kind of two-step procedure and, and, and caring about minimizing the dispersion throughout the Brillouin ring zone, what we do with the partly occupied Vanya functions, and I, I think that's probably not a very good name for these Vanya functions, but that was the best I could come up with 15 years ago. So that name is sort of um, um, stuck to these Vanya functions. So what we do instead of the two-step procedure is to simply minimize the spread functional, minimize the spread, meaning maximizing the omega functional in a one-step procedure. So if we think first of a non-periodic system, then we have Vanya function N here that we write as a linear combination of the M lowest eigenstates um, with a unitary uh, transformation matrix in front. And then we have a set of um, what we call extra degrees of freedom here, um, the phi L's. And um, they are also rotated around together with the psi functions. And these extra degrees of freedoms, the phi's, they are simply uh, linear combinations of all the eigenstates that we do not include in our lowest sort of M dimensional subspace over here. So with this construction, we ensure that uh, the M lowest eigenstates are exactly reproduced by our Vanya functions. Then the um, extra degrees of freedom, the um, um, phi L functions here, they are chosen such as to minimize the spread of the Vanya functions. Uh, and they should be orthogonal to each other. And um, so what we are searching for is the global maximum of the omega function um, that depends now on these uh, unitary matrices U and the coefficient uh, matrix C that defines the extra degrees of freedom. And we optimize uh, U and C uh, simultaneously. Okay, so here's just an illustration. Uh, if we, this is for just very simplified uh, H2 molecule, we have a bonding orbital and then we find uh, an orbital up in the uh, set of unoccupied orbitals, which is an um, antibonding orbital. And when we sum and subtract them, we get the original um, atomic orbitals back. So that's kind of the simple uh, idea behind this. Um, this can also be formulated for periodic cells. So for, for a periodic cell, we uh, write the Vanya functions in the usual uh, form here where we sum over is uh, generalized block states and the generalized block uh, states are defined in this way. Um, so this follows exactly uh, what I showed before. We use, we, we make unitary transformations uh, within a space that consists of the lowest M eigenstates and then a set of, of uh, extra degrees of freedom uh, and um, that we then optimize for each value of K. And yeah, I'm not going to, to go into detail with how we, how we do this in practice, but if you're interested, you can look in these uh, uh, references down here. So let me just show you an example. Um, this is the band structure of copper, I believe, where we have the D bands, the flat D bands, and then we have an S band that goes uh, through. Uh, and E0 is defined as the um, uh, energy uh, cutoff window. So all the states below E0 is what we include here in our construction. So we assure that all the bands below E0 are exactly reproduced. So 
if we want to have six Vanya, uh, seven Vanya functions, as in this case, then you can see that in this region um, of the brillouin zone, um, we have mk equal to six because we have below E0, we have, um, we have six occupied bands. And then we have LK equal to one because we need then one extra degree of freedom that can be chosen up here as linear combination of all the states above E0. In this region over here, there are only five states below our cutoff energy. So in this case, we have L for these K points, we have LK equal to two. And, and so we find two extra degrees of freedom. Um, and again, these extra degrees of freedoms together with the rotation matrices are optimized simultaneously in order to um, um, maximize the omega functional. So in order to uh, minimize the, the spread, the total spread of all the Vanier functions. Okay, so now uh, the question is how many uh, extra degrees of freedom should we include in the construction? And here is an example. So one way to, to define the optimal number of, of Vanier functions and therefore the optimal number of extra degrees of freedom is to maximize the spread per Vanier function, um, which would be this expression here. And here's an example for a, a silicon five cluster where you can see the average localization. So um, this quantity here plotted as a function of the extra degrees of freedom that we include in the construction. And you can see this peaks for four uh, extra degrees of freedom here. And with that choice, we are getting very um, nice symmetrically positioned and, and uh, uh, highly localized Vanier functions. The black dots here indicate the census of those Vanier functions. Okay, uh, we've, here's a couple of other cases. For example, uh, if you take a benzene molecule, um, if you only take the occupied set of, of states in the construction of the Vanier functions, then you get this set of Vanier functions. If you, if you incl include three extra degrees of freedom, then you get this more symmetric set of Vanier functions. So you get six of these uh, sigma bonds and sigma bonds and these PZ orbitals. And uh, L equal to three, in fact, corresponds to the maximum in the um, average um, localization functional as shown over here. Um, and this is a case of a, an, an infinite platinum chain. And here is a case of a, a platinum chain with a hydrogen molecule uh, incorporated. And what I'm showing you down here is um, the eigenstate. So um, the eigenstates included in the um, uh, set of Vanier functions. So in the case of the benzene molecule, you can see we have all the occupied states and then we have the first and unoccupied states selected as the extra degrees of freedom and then a higher lying uh, orbital up here. So this is selected simply because when including this, it will lead to the highest localization of the entire set of functions. And a similar situation occurs for the platinum chain. Whereas for this uh, um, platinum H2 system, you can see that the uh, extra degrees, the last extra degree of freedom up here is not a particular eigenstate, but it is actually a linear combination of different eigenstates that is selected as the most ideal um, um, degree of freedom to include in order to get the most uh, localized Vanier functions. Here is another uh, example. Um, I believe this is again a uh, band structure of copper where you can see uh, the effect of moving the uh, uh, energy uh, cutoff here from zero and up to three. When we do that, we sacrifice a little bit of, uh, of localization of the Vanier functions, but we get a better description of the, uh, of the S band here. Okay, so uh, what is the problem? The problem is that sometimes when we uh, perform the maximization of this uh, spread functional here, we will get solutions where one or a few of the Vanier functions we find are not very localized. Sometimes they can be um, pretty bad and, 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 and quite delocalized. And this is obviously a problem because a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So if we have one, one Vanier function that is not well localized, well, then that defines 
the range of the type binding Hamiltonian we can create from these and, and uh, it's not very desirable. So um, then one can ask whether this is a, an effect of, of the functional getting trapped in a local minimum, which is not the global minimum of the functional. Uh, sorry, it's actually a maximum when we talk about uh, omega or whether it's really a property of the global maximum of this functional up here. Um, but no matter whether it's, it's one or the other um, answer to this question, we would like to really uh, penalize the solutions where one or a few Vanier functions are delocalized. And we can do that. Uh, and, and that means we want actually a more democratic localization scheme that, that does not sacrifice one Vanier function or a few, Vanier function um, um, because it's better and then optimize all the other ones even more. So we thought about how one could do that. And, and one strategy here would be to, instead of just including uh, the C matrix elements of the Vanier functions, and by the way, Z equal to one means a perfectly well-localized Vanier function. And when Z is equal to zero, it means a completely delocalized Vanier function, okay? Uh, so we want to have largest possible values for C when we find Vanier functions. Um, then we can think about taking a function of C. And if we do that, the blue uh, dotted line here would correspond to the standard functional. Um, but if we choose functions here that have a steeper slope uh, for small values of, of X as compared to larger values of X, then you can uh, imagine that you have a Vanier function that is lying up here, have a large value of, of C and you have another one with a smaller value of C. Then it would actually, which is not desirable, right? Because this would be a delocalized Vanier function. Then due to this larger slope for small values of C, it will be advantageous to move some of the localization, so to speak, from the uh, uh, Vanier function up here to the Vanier function uh, down here. Right when we optimize the sum of the two terms. So this would be one way of, 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 of ensuring that we don't have uh, a few Vanier functions that become particularly delocalized. Another one is to add a penalty to the spread functional here, which is proportional to the variance of the spread of all the Vanier functions. So now you should think of your uh, entire set of Vanier functions each of those have a certain spread um, and that gives you a distribution and you can think of the width of that distribution. We would actually like that to be not too large because that means we will have Vanier function. If it's large, it means we have Vanier functions that are well localized, but we also have some that are not very well localized. So we would like to minimize the variance, okay? Um, but of course we shouldn't only just minimize the variance because we should also minimize the spread of the functions at the same time. So there is a kind of trade-off and we can control that by this weight parameter in front of the penalty term. And what I'm showing you down here is for uh, a silicon crystal. Um, I'm showing you the average spread of all the Vanier functions that we have in the set and the spread of the most delocalized Vanier function that we find. And um, the error bars and the plots here is because we've, we've done this for 10 different um, uh, random initial guesses for the Vanier functions and we obtain slightly different solutions uh, every time. And then we take just the average value and, and show here as well, uh, the spread as well. So what you can see is for very uh, small values of the weight uh, functional, we have the standard functional, okay? The standard partly occupied Vanier functions and, and they're lying down here. Um, when we then increase the weight functional, then we um, increase a little bit the average spread. So we sacrifice the average spread a little bit, but we drastically improve the maximum spread, the spread of the most delocalized linear function. So in particular, if we use very high values for this weight functional, we are up here and you can see the average spread of the set of linear functions is more or less the same as the spread of the most delocalized Vanier functions. So all the Vanier functions in this case have more or less the same uh, spread. This is not what we want, obviously. Uh, we want to be somewhere in between. So this is the value um, that we have chosen um, um, parameter equal to uh, one times the number of Vanier functions. This 
needs to scale with the number of Vanier functions because the, the total spread functional here will scale linearly with the number of Vanier functions as well. So that is the value I'll be using throughout um, this talk here. Okay, so let's take a look at what this uh, new functional um, localization functional actually does. And this is a case of a two-dimensional semiconductor, um, tungsten, molybdenum, telluride. It's, um, it's a material with 12 atoms per cell. It has 52 occupied bands and a band gap of 0.9. Um, electron volts. And so here we have this um, um, variance minimizing functional. And <clears throat> what I'm plotting over here is as a function of the optimization step in this iterative optimization of the, um, of the U and C coefficients, I'm showing this, uh, the value of this uh, penalty term here. So essentially the variance of the set of Vanier functions. And not surprising, you can see that um, very quickly, this becomes smaller when we optimize um, uh, the variance uh, functional here as compared to mean, uh, optimization of just the traditional omega functional. Uh, so this is not uh, surprising that this happens. And up here, you can see a plot of um, the most delocalized Vanier function that we find um, this is what we obtained with the standard functional. Here you can see we have an average spread over all the Vanier functions of 2.7. Uh, and we have a spread for the most delocalized Vanier functions of uh, 21.5. If we instead use the variance uh, minimizing functional, then we sacrifice a little bit the average delocalization. Uh, you can see the spread increases from 2.7 to 2.8 but we get a drastic improvement in the localization of the most delocalized Vanier function here going from 21 to five. Um, okay, then again, we can um, talk about how many extra degrees of freedoms we should include when we run the Vanierization. And a quality indicator for a good set of Vanier functions would be um, the average band interpolation error so we try to reconstruct the Cohn-Sham eigenvalues in terms of the resulting set of Vanier functions. And then we look at the, um, um, the average error. And the other one would be the spread of the most delocalized Vanier function. So here is another example um, where this, I believe is for uh, MOS2, uh, another two-dimensional semiconductor. And the difference between these two cases here is the set of Vanier functions that we have chosen. So to the left, we want to have, so the dashed line here is E0. That's everything below this line we include exactly in our Vanierization space. Um, and that corresponds to, so you can see at this point here, we have exactly 16 states below. So that means that the minimum number of Vanier functions we can choose to have with this E0 would be 16. So this is what I would call the minimal number of Vanier function. This is 16 in this case. Then you can see in other parts of the Brill ring zone, uh, there are only 15 states below, and then we have one extra degree of freedom. With this choice, we find a maximum um, uh, a spread of uh, 5.3. Okay, so then we can also try to include um, one more uh, degree of freedom. So now we have uh, 17, um, Vanier functions in total. And you can see we get a better description of the bands and we get a drastic reduction again in the spread of the most delocalized Vanier function. Um, so that suggests that one way of finding the optimal number of Vanier functions, so equivalently to the optimal number of extra degrees of freedom is to look at the maximum spread and then find the minimum. Um, on such a curve here as a function of the total number of Vanier functions that we use. So in the case of uh, gallium arsenide that I'm showing you here, you can see that, that the minimum um, is obtained for eight Vanier functions. And again, um, the error bar here is because we always have uh, five to 10 different uh, initial guesses. So this becomes a, a, st a statistical thing. 
Um, and you can see when we have uh, eight Vanya functions, we also get a very nice, um, a very small interpolation error for the bands and um, yeah, uh, significantly lower value of the maximum spread. Okay, so that's the way we pick the uh, optimal number of Vanya functions. What about the initial guess? So here we have found that a good way of initializing the Vanya functions is to use atomic orbitals. And um, so we use projections of atomic orbitals onto the uh, set of, uh, of Vanya functions. So this uh, is the way we initialize um, um, the routine and, and this leads to uh, initial values for the U and C matrices. So what we do in this protocol is we say for atoms with valence D or F electrons, we use the five um, or seven um, atom-centered atomic orbitals because these are typically very um, localized to begin with. And then for the remaining set of um, Vanya functions that we need to initialize, we just use S orbitals that are centered at a random position in the, in the crystal but always within the sphere of radius 1. Angstrom, uh, 1.5 angstrom um, around one of the atoms in the cell. So there is some degree of, uh, of randomness in the, in the initial guess, not for the D and F electrons, but for, for, for everything else. So here you can see um, results of the vanurization with a hundred different uh, random seeds for this initial guess. And, um, this is the result for silicon when we pick the minimal number of uh, Vanya functions with an E0 at the conduction band minimum plus 2 EV. And you can see that there are essentially two types of, of solutions that we find, both with the standard functional and with the new variance minimizing functional. So we can end here or we can end down here, depending on the initial guess. But what you can also see is that we always gain a lot in the maximum spread, which is the horizontal axis here consistently, and we sacrifice a little bit in average spread. So that's the same as what we've seen before. If we choose the optimal number of uh, Vanya functions, as I just described uh, previously how we determine, then um, we don't get so um, uh, two different types of solutions. But again, you see that consistently we get um, um, a smaller maximum spread when we use the variance minimal, uh, minimizing functional compared to the standard functional. And we sacrifice not really anything for this case in, uh, in average localization. Okay. So um, here are some other examples um, that, we have, um, that we have considered. This is an NV center in diamond, and this is hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms adsorbed on a ruthenium slab. And this is the number of Vanya functions that we have in these cases. And uh, over here, we have the um, um, maximum spread. So the spread of the most delocalized Vanya function in the set that we find. Again, this is searched over, um, I think five, five different random seeds for the initial guess. So there is a little bit of variation. Uh, this is the band interpolation error or the uh, eigenvalue interpolation error that we find. And this is the, these are the corresponding results with the variance minimizing functional. And you can see that um, uh, systematically we get better localization of the most delocalized uh, Vanya function. So this is exactly uh, what we expect to get. Um, the, uh, uh, the energy interpolation error is, is very comparable. So we don't see a really a systematic improvement in the in the band interpolation error, but we see a systematic improvement in the um, um, in the maximum uh, spread. Okay, so uh, we took this um, um, algorithm uh, with the uh, protocol for choosing the uh, initial guess and the protocol for selecting the um, optimal number of Vanya functions. And then we tried it on a set of uh, 30 different um, 2D materials. So our test set here comprises 22 semiconductors and eight metals. Uh, and we use for all the calculations uh, an energy threshold E0, uh, which is the conduction band minimum plus 2EV or the Fermi level plus 2EV for metals. 
And this is summarizing the results we find after running the um, vinylization. These are the results upper panel here with the standard localization functional. And this is with the variance minimizing functional. And this is for, in both cases, it's for the minimal number of Vanya functions we can have for this uh, energy threshold. And what you see, if we look uh, at the left plot here, um, the green curve here uh, is uh, x equal to y, and the red curve is uh, um, y equal to two times x. So if we decide this region, it means that the spread of the most delocalized Vanya function is, um, um, is um, oh sorry, that the average spread is within two times that of the maximum spread. So we would actually like to be um, furthest to the left in this plot here. And that, there is a vast improvement when we go from the standard functional to the variance minimal, uh, minimizing functional here. You can see the scale changes from 25 to 10 here. So the materials, um, for all the materials, we're moving significantly closer over here, meaning that we really get a much better, um, a much lower variance in the spread of, of our set of Vanya functions. Um, the maximum band interpolation error here is more or less the same in the two cases. So as I mentioned before, we don't see a, a, a drastic improvement there. Then we can do the same, but for the optimal number of, of Vanya functions, here, where we have found, we have chosen that um, such as to um, really minimize the spread of the most delocalized Vanya function. Okay, and we have do, done that in both cases for the standard functional and for the variance minimizing functional. And again, um, in this case, we see a drastic improvement using the, um, the variance minimizing functional as compared to the optimal functional when we just look at the um, average spread and maximum spread. And again, band interpolation error is, is, is pretty similar with the two functions. Okay, so now um, I'm switching gears and I wanna tell you a little bit about the atomic simulation environment because all of uh, um, the Vanya function code that I've discussed so far is actually implemented in the, uh, in the ASC. So this is historically um, the first Python library for atomic simulation dates back to um, the work by Suna Bain and Carsten Jakobsen in 2002, where the ASC was introduced. And the main idea was to um, consider DFT codes really as external black boxes that can provide energies and forces, uh, and then use uh, Python code to implement functionalities that do not really depend on the actual DFT code. Um, the ASC is an open source code. It, you can find it on GitLab and it has a, a fairly large uh, a community behind it. So there are about uh, 250 contributors to the ASC uh, as of today. And um, it, here is um, a simple sketch of the ASC, what it consists of. It has classes, an atom class, which is a central object. Um, you can then put different uh, visualization and analysis uh, classes onto that object and constraints. Um, and then you have different molecular dynamics, energy optimization uh, schemes that you can hook onto this as well. And then we have calculators uh, and those could be any kind of DFT code and in, or uh, our classical potential code. And in fact, um, we have interfaces in ASC to, um, uh, let me just show you that now, to a very large set of, of DFT codes, as you can see here. Um, so these are the supported calculators. The interface to these codes um, vary a lot. To some of them, they are very rudimentary. Uh, for others, they are very well developed. Um, okay, and this is just to show that it's a, a pretty active, um, uh, the ASE code is pretty active. This is the number of, of issues in GitLab um, that have been created, uh, opened and closed um, over the years. And uh, this is showing um, the development in the uh, ASE from its first version 1.0 to the current version three in terms of numbers of lines and of, of, of codes and, and uh, uh, you can also see here, that's kind of interesting perhaps, that there has been a very much increased focus on tests 
Um, that's the blue here. Um, so there are quite a lot of a large uh, focus on, 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 on testing the ASE code nowadays because uh, obviously this is important to make sure that it doesn't break. All right, now um, what we have then done more recently is to uh, develop a, a workflow uh, framework that we call Atomic Simulation Recipes uh, that is in many ways similar to the ASE, similar in spirit. Um, to the ASE and it also uses the ASE quite a lot. Um, and here the focus is not on the actual um, calculation, but um, or on, the, uh, on the atomic structure, but on the calculation itself. So this is a tool for managing the calculations and also the data that they produce. It's in that way similar to the AIDA um, framework that I'm sure you've heard about during the school. Um, so it implements workflows for automated uh, computations, and we have focused on, on this being as simple as possible, uh, very modular and, and flexible and transparent. So it's, you really know what goes on behind the curtain, you can say, and it should be easy for users and developers to go and, and, and develop their own workflows and also change existing workflows. Again, open source, and you can find it on GitLab. Um, so uh, here's an overview of the structure of the ASR. So we, um, we talk to different DFT codes through the atomic simulation environment and the interfaces that already exist there. And then the core of the ASR consists of, of, of a caching mechanism um, that keeps track of all the results of the calculations um, and maintains the data provenance and, and uh, keep tracks of, of the dependency uh, graphs. And then there are the recipes, which are really, um, you can say ASE like Python scripts that perform specific material simulations that could be relaxing a structure, calculating a band structure and so on and so forth. And then we have some additional um, modules here that can help to visualize the data, micro data if you're updating um, your recipes uh, and we have a, a, a task scheduler here that can talk to the supercomputer um, that makes it easy to submit large numbers of calculations and, and, and uh, keep track of them. And then we have some, some tools for visualizing um, the results, putting together databases and, and visualizing them um, in, uh, in browsers. Okay, um, so, um, the calculations I will show you in a minute are all performed with the GPO code that is also an open source code um, that um, has a lot of nice uh, features here. And um, it's also a community effort, but uh, some of the main developers behind the code are, are located here at, at, at DTU at the moment. Now here's a high throughput example that we have, where we have used uh, the GPO code together with the ASR. And, and this is um, this computational 2D materials database that I mentioned, the C2DB, which uh, today uh, contains results for about 4,000 different two-dimensional materials and, uh, and a lot of their properties. Um, you can go and, and, and browse it here if you're interested. And um, you know this, this was created, this was really a, a quite a, a painstaking effort to create this. Um, and it was really during the creation of this of, of this database here that we learned how to do these uh, high throughput, ca throughput calculations and how to, and, and, and so the ASR idea grew out of that project. So today you can create, we can create the entire C2DB uh, database with a, with, a single, um, with a single command here, which will launch um, about 60,000 individual DFT calculations and, and most of them uh, uh, locally converge and produce reasonable uh, or uh, high quality, I should say, output that we can then collect into, into a database. And uh, if you go and browse this database, you will, you will see this, this kind of, of uh, interface here. This is the kind of database uh, web panels that can be produced by the ASR. Um, and uh, you can search for materials and you can then find the materials down here, click them, and then you see um, um, some sort of uh, summary panel here, and you have all the properties that we have computed over here. You can click these panels 
Uh, you can see, you can first click the question marks, what it is we have calculated. There's a little explanation there, um, it's kind of background information, and then you can go and, and, and look at the results. So um, one particular application, um, this is also data that is contained in the C2DB that I want to just uh, spend five minutes on here before I um, end is uh, topological insulators, because as I mentioned at the beginning, this is kind of related to Banya functions. And I'm sure you've heard about that relation already uh, in the summer school. So topological insulators are uh, materials that have some non-trivial and symmetry protected topological order of some kind. Typically the bulk is an insulator, and then we can have symmetry protected um, conducting states at the edges or the interfaces of these um, insulators. So here is a, a visualization of a quantum spin hole insulator where we have um, a 2D material that is an insulator um, in its bulk form. But then here on the edges, we have these uh, helical edge states where we have spin up and spin down electrons moving in opposite directions. Um, so this is the corresponding um, band structure diagram over here. So the challenge and what we were interested in in this study here was to see if we could find topological insulators among all the 2D materials in the, in the C2DB database that had as large as possible a band gap, because the band gap is really an issue here. If you find a topological insulator with a small band gap, then it's really difficult to use it. So the larger the band gap in the, in the bulk form is, the more the easier it is to place the Fermi level in here and really exploit these uh, symmetry protected uh, um, uh, edges that we have. So that's kind of the challenge. Um, a little bit of, of, of background here. Um, the, type, the way we do the calculations is actually not using Vanya functions, but, but I'll come back to the relation to Vanya functions in a minute. But what we do is we use the so-called uh, parallel transport gauge which is um, a gauge, and, and when I say gauge, you know, you should think of choosing the right block, uh, uh, the right uh, faces for the block functions as a function of k in the Brillouin zone. So um, here we choose the gauge that really um, minimizes the variation um, across the Vanya functions, uh, uh, sorry, across the, uh, the functions uh, here in the Brillouin zone. So specifically, we fix uh, one of the 2K uh, vectors. So this is the, um, um, this is uh, not the Brillouin zone, but this is the uh, um, uh, primitive cell in reciprocal space. And then we fix uh, K2, and then we go along, we vary K1, and we really choose the, uh, we choose the, um, uh, the faces here on the block functions, such as to minimize uh, the variation make them as smooth as possible as we, as we vary K1. And that condition here, if we just have a single band, amounts to choosing this overlap between two neighboring block states along this line, choose that to be real. So once we've done that, we can then take a tour here across the Brillouin zone. And this is actually a loop in the Brillouin zone because of the periodic boundary conditions, because of the topology of, of, of this, this cell here. And from that, we can derive uh, the Berry phase here that we call uh, gamma one of K2. So for a fixed value of two, we get the Berry phase along this trajectory here in the Brillouin zone. So, uh, now the relation to Vanya functions, so hybrid Vanya functions is that <clears throat> since we now have smoothly varying phases here, we can construct Vanya functions out of them and they will now be uh, localized along the x1 direction, so along this direction here, not along the x2 direction, but along x1. So we have um, the center of the Vanya functions along x1 that we can calculate, and it can be shown that that equals uh, the Berry phase that I just uh, uh, mentioned over here, apart from a factor of 2 pi. Um, so this means that the Berry phase here can be interpreted as uh, the Vanya centers along X1. So furthermore, it's possible to show using the so-called Cooper formula that the Hall conductivity of a system is essentially equal to the churn number. Um, the churn number um, is the flux of the Berry curvature through the 
uh, free ring zone. And that number is, is a topological index that can take any integer value. Now, by applying an electric field along um, the X2 direction, then if you do that, that can be incorporated into the block Hamiltonian in this way. So we change from K2 to K2 minus um, this value here. So there is a time argument here because the electric field is the time derivative of the vector potential. So this is, this is actually the vector potential that will give the electric field if you take the um, time derivative. And now um, the charge transported along X1 during this particular time interval here is actually uh, equal to minus the ele elementary charge times the churn number, right? This can be shown by using this expression here for the Hall conductivity. So this means now that <clears throat> the churn number um, is, is given by the number of Vanier centers that cross a plane normal to X1, okay? Um, because by varying, um, uh, K2 here, then we can, and this corresponds to applying the electric field varying K2, we can then, we can then measure how many or calculate how many of these Vanier centers cross a line here in this, in this uh, Berry phase plot. And that will be the number of, of charges that will move um, perpendicular to the electric field when it's applied for this amount of time here. So this is a way of getting to the uh, churn number. This is a, a, a particular case for iron uh, bromide here where uh, you can see the evolution of these uh, berry phases as a function of, of K2 here. So in this case, you can see that the, the churn number is equal to one because as we vary a K2 here, then the, the, uh, the Vanya centers here, um, no matter where we put a line, there will be exactly one Vanya center that crosses that line. So that's the way we calculate um, the, um, the churn number of these uh, insulators. And that in turn gives us the topological indices of the material. So in this uh, screening study here, we looked at uh, three different types of topological insulators. So the, um, uh, we look for quantum spin hall insulators where we have this um, uh, particular binary. Um, this is not the, the churn number. Um, but um, this is a different topological index called the C2 index. Um, we looked for quantum anomalous Hall insulators, which is just given by the uh, churn number. So for when you have um, uh, time reversal symmetry, the churn number is all, always equal to zero. Uh, so the quantum spin Hall insulators are relevant in this case. Uh, but when you have spontaneously broken uh, time reversal symmetry, for example, when you have a ferromagnetic uh, ground state, uh, it's possible to have churn numbers that differ from zero. So then we talk about the quantum anomalous Hall insulator. And then finally, we look for crystalline topological insulators um, where we simply use the difference of the churn number between the um, uh, two types of, of, of eigenstates corresponding to the uh, mirror operation in the two-dimensional plane. So when you have a mirror plane, um, you can classify the eigenstates according to whether they're even or odd under the mirror operation. And then in those two subspaces, you can actually calculate the churn number. And then the difference between these two will be the, um, this mirror churn index, which is again, a, uh, an integer number. So we find here, so this is the topology that we find. And all of these have actually been reported before in the literature and we reproduce all of those uh, with our screening approach. But then we also find a number of, of previously unknown uh, topological insulators. You can see here, these are the new quantum spin hall insulators that we find from screening uh, more than 3000 uh, 2D materials. And here is the Kontian gap that we compute. And I've highlighted these um, antimony based uh, halides because they uh, have really large um, um, band gaps. So they're interesting. And they are fairly stable. This is showing the energy above the convex hull, um, which can be taken as, as an indication of the thermodynamic stability of these materials. Ideally, you would like them to be zero, but if they are sort of within 0 0.1, 0 0.2 EV, then it might be possible to synthesize them um, in any case. And, and you can see that's the case for these uh, materials here. So again, if you wanna know more about this study, you can take a look in this paper here. 
Uh, finally, um, just a word of caution here. Um, when you deal with these topological uh, materials here, they are kind of difficult to, to model at a quantitative level. One example is, uh, is this material, palladium diselenium, uh, um, where we find a, a huge increase in the band gap when we go from PBE to GW, it's been seen for other topological uh, insulators as well, that the band gap is, is, is very sensitive. Uh, to the way you treat exchange correlation effects. Another thing to be aware of is that for these quantum anomalous hole insulators that are magnetic, they can be highly sensitive um, to the exchange correlation functional. In particular, um, the, um, um, the topological indices can change depending on whether you use something like PBE or PBE sol or LDA, you can get different uh, values for the churn number. And if you do LDA plus U, then again, the topological uh, indices uh, can depend on the value use, you use for U. And similarly, for the same class of, of, of uh, topological materials, um, the value here of the churn index for this, is, uh, for this, this uh, oxide here um, can also depend on the easy axis that you choose for the material. So as a function of that axis, you can get different classification of the, uh, um, of the material. Um, so that's just a word of, of, of warning. And I think we, we need to look further into the modeling of these materials here from, from uh, with ab initio methods. Okay, and with that, I'm, I'm at the end. And uh, just to summarize, since this is on Vanya functions, I'll focus the summary here on the spread balanced Vanya functions, which is the new uh, thing that we've contributed with uh, recently. Um, this is starting from the party occupied Vanya functions and then introducing this more democratic um, spread functional with a, with a penalty term to make sure that we um, get small variances in the spread um, over the set of Vanya functions. This significantly reduced the localization of the most delocalized orbitals without really sacrificing the uh, average localization of the orbitals. Um, then I've also introduced uh, protocols for uh, choosing an initial guess and for selecting the optimal number of Vanya functions and shown how that can be used to automatically construct uh, very well-behaved uh, Vanya functions in an automated uh, fashion. I think this could be interesting for high throughput uh, Vanyaization. Um, and then <clears throat> this is uh, um, the ASE module that we have for Vanya functions is not uh, very advanced at the moment. So there are uh, features that we do not have. Uh, we would be very happy if, if someone would be interested in, in, in working on that. So for example, we don't have uh, support spin orbit coupling. Uh, we can only create Vanya functions for calculations with no spin orbit coupling. And we do not, we cannot make uh, Vanya functions that respect the symmetries of, of the crystal structure, which is another thing that would be uh, very nice to have. Uh, if you're interested, you can go here and, uh, and explore a bit more. There is not a lot of documentation, but there are some examples of how to use the code. Um, and then the acknowledge, uh, acknowledgements here, uh, Petro Fontana actually did um, all the work on the spread balance Vanya functions during his master project uh, with me last year. Uh, Asgjord Larsen is the main developer of the ASE and also the ASR. Um, Jens Jørgen Mortensen is the main GPOR developer, so he's also sort of involved in almost all the projects we do here um, when it comes to code development. And Thomas Olsen is interested in, uh, in magnetic properties and, and topology and has also been involved in the uh, study I showed you on, on screening for new 2D topological insulators. And with that, I would like to thank you for the attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer if we have time for that. Well, thank you for the very nice talk. We absolutely have some time for questions. So let's start for the people in presence here in Trieste. Please raise your hand and I will come to your uh, workstation with a, uh, with a microphone. Okay, Stefan has one. <laughs> No. 
Thank you, Christian, for giving this nice talk. My question uh -huh. is the following. Uh, you analyze the quality of your one year functions uh, in terms of the spreads. But did you compare how well they, or how precise uh, they interpolate the band structures in comparing to maybe to the one year 90 one year functions? Um, yes. Um... Well, I can't remember. I think we did also comparisons to the Vanya 90. I think that it's uh, it's kind of similar. And um, also what I show here is really the um, uh, the band interpolation error mm -hmm. between the spread balanced Vanya function ah, and the standard sorry, uh, Vanya functions. And it's very similar. So even though we get an improvement in the spread, in particular, uh, the spread of the most delocalized Vanya functions, which I'm sure could be advantageous in, in certain cases, um, we do not see a systematic improvement of the interpolation error mm -hmm. with these. This is comparing to our partly occupied Vanya functions and not the Vanya functions in, in Vanya 90, but I would suspect it to be very similar. Okay, thank you. I think I fixed this. Uh, <clears throat> any other questions? Okay, that's one from Ivo. Hi. Uh, my question is so the problem that your new uh, method uh, solves of having one value function that is much more delocalized than the others uh, is this something that is specific? So you are part of the pipeline functions original methodology, or is it something that is also present for the same materials with the disentanglement method? I would suspect that it's also present there um, because the partly occupied Vanya functions, um, they would be more localized than the, um, the ones you get from the disentanglement method because it is a global optimization of, of the spread functional um, so I, I, although I haven't checked it, um, I would, I would suspect that you would have a similar issue or could have a similar issue with, with the Vanya functions, um, coming from the disentanglement method. Thank you. Thank you. But, but since you are a, a, a bunch of users out there, I mean, of course, I would also be interested in hearing, I mean, this is based on my own, uh, our own experience here, that it's possible in particular for complex materials. And, and when I say complex materials, I mean uh, materials where you would like to disentangle bands. There is not a natural band gap where you can put your sort of your, your energy threshold, but you need to cut through uh, bands. That's, that's one aspect that makes the vanyarization complex. Another one is simply the size of the system. So for large systems, um, is it also something that, that, that you as users experience uh, as a problem from time to time, or do you always find nice and, and, and well-localized vanya functions? Anyone wants to answer that? <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe we are trying to solve a problem that isn't there, but um, I mean, it's in our experience. Okay, from everyone that, uh, yes, there are a lot of problems constructing what your functions, otherwise, uh, maybe this pool would be much shorter. <laughs> okay, that's a great answer. <laughs> so, so this is one of the cases where you, where I'm sort of happy to hear that there are problems, right? Because it means this might be useful. Um, at least we found it more robust in in general. And and but I I think there's still a lot of work to do here with this with this method and this idea of creating uh, spread functionals that are giving more robust uh, results. Um, for example, there's this um, weight parameter here. Um, where is it? Where is it? 
there. This way parameter that says how large this penalty term should, should be. This we have not uh, studied at, at, at systematically at any level, sort of, sort of just pick the value. And then we've, we've gone with that. Uh, there is also this other strategy over here, um, which we didn't really pursue much um, because this was a master project, one uh, half a year. And I should say that Petra really did a, a really excellent uh, job. And I was very uh, kind of sad that he didn't want to continue with a, with a PhD, but, uh, but he went to a, to a job uh, at Synopsys where they actually developed electronic structure codes for the industry. And, um, and they also very they were very happy to have him and, and, and he's doing well there. But um, it was a short and intense um, period of, of development that, that Petra did. And uh, yeah, so there are many, still many open questions, I think. Okay, I see there was a question in the chat by Rafael <clears throat> Gonzalez. He asked, share number should be a robust topology indicator. Why does it depend on the exchange correlation potential? Well, um, you know, if you have small band gaps that could, that could, well, it should be robust, yes. But changing from one exchange correlation functional to another, um, you, you know, you cannot necessarily see that as a continuous change in the Hamiltonian uh, where you do not, uh, during that path, move through a, a, a quantum phase transition where the band uh, where the where the band gap closes so you know it's not really something that i think you can be sure that um, a topological index cannot change if you shift to a different exchange correlation function it's sort of a uh, an abrupt a discontinuous change in the description of the hamiltonian that is not necessarily adiabatically connected Okay, so I actually I have a question myself. So a couple of days ago, maybe it was yesterday, I'm not sure. We had a lecture by uh, Lin Lin who said that is very, what was like variational method is formally equivalent to your uh, partially occupied vanier functions. You know, it's, although actually it seems that are very different from your presentation. I don't know if you if you want to comment on that or uh, or you know the work of Lin Lin on on this uh, because he also proposed to directly minimize the entire spread function instead of doing, you know, the two-step procedure. Yes. Um, you know, he has, he has basically shown that you can, you can recast this um, uh, formalism that I presented as a variational problem. Um, so it's solving the same problem, but into coming from two different sides. Uh, but uh, no, I, I don't know. I haven't read the paper in, in detail, but uh, uh, I trust it when he says it's it's equivalent, and uh, um, so I, I think it's just a matter of the way it's formulated mathematically. Uh, what we do is much more um, in line with the original formulation um, by um, Nicola and 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 uh, and, and David uh, Vanderbilt, um, whereas I think he phrases it in a in a more mathematical way, in a diff different mathematical way. So the way we do the optimization in practice is uh, that <clears throat> these extra degrees of freedom here, these coefficients, uh, they have to be kept orthogonal um, and normalized during the uh, optimization. And we use the method of Lagrange multipliers to do that. So there is just a, a little extra term um, in the, uh, so it's, it's basically a, a, an optimization problem, a constrained optimization problem, where the constraint is that these coefficients here should be kept orthogonal and normalized. Uh, the way uh, the U matrices are, are implemented is the same way. So um, we are sort of guaranteed with this method to get unitary matrices for the, for the U's here. Uh, and then we treat these with Lagrange multipliers. And it's maybe not the most elegant way uh, to solve the, uh, the optimization problem. Um, so that's the good old uh, partly occupied Vanier functions. And then when we get to the uh, spread balanced ones here, um, you know, expression will also just in, in, involve uh, the U and the C coefficients. And you just have to take the derivative of this term as well. 
when you want to get the, the gradient of the, of the functional here. And the same thing over here. You can also take the gradient of this one using the, um, uh, the chain rule. And, and, and then you have analytic expressions again for the, uh, for, the, for the gradients. And then you can do the optimization in exactly the same way. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? If not, I think we can thank our speaker again. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for, for, for having me, for accepting our invitation. Uh, so now we have a, a short coffee break. It's like 15 minutes just upstairs. And then we will have, I think the last session of the day by Sinisa Ko on uh, tight bounding models. And after that at five, uh, 10, let's say, we have the online poster session, okay? Right here, always here.